professor emeritus at Arizona State University, and uh, serving, after serving as an intelligence officer in the Air Force, he earned his PhD from the University of Texas, and um, he worked at the University of Texas Institute for Texas, Texas Cultures and uh, associate director of the Texas State, State Historical Society. Anyway. Instead of you just talking, we'd love to listen to you. Okay. Uh, uh, Doris Miller, so well, welcome. Be my turn, then. Okay. Thank you so much. How y'all doing? All right. All right. Great. Appreciate your being here. Okay. Hope you stay to the bitter end. Uh, <laughs> they, they tell you in Toastmasters that you never begin a speech by complaining or making excuses. But I've got to say that last week I had some eye surgery that didn't go exactly according to plan and my vision is skewed. So uh, my face is going to be in my notes, for which please forgive me, you can see the top of my bald head. But uh, as, as we said, this is a, we're going to be talking tonight about uh, Doris Miller. Uh, among the pantheon of America's military and naval heroes, none is more improbable than the son of a Texas sharecropper, Doris Miller. And yes, his name was Doris. Uh, as, as was common uh, at the time and place, midwives were, in lieu of a fee, were allowed to name the babies that they delivered. And Henry Adam Miller's midwife, mm, they can't, oh, there you go. You can't use the laser on her. Okay. Her oh, I guess I can. <laughs> but Henry Adam Miller's midwife was certain that her baby was going to be a girl, and so named him Doris. <laughs> and uh, a little bit prematurely, but the name stuck. Everybody liked Doris. And Doris himself. Nobody gave him a bad time about it. Uh, Doris Miller became fullback of his high school football team. He was heavyweight boxing champion of his first battleship. And uh, so far as I can tell, nobody said anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly would not it. But uh, Doris Miller was born on the 12th of October. 1919, during the darkest days of the lynching epidemic that blighted the South uh, during during those the, well, the first decades of the 20th century, and he grew up during the depths of the Great Depression. Only three years before Miller was born, his hometown of Waco was the scene of one of the most brutal lynchings on record. When 17-year-old Jesse Washington was burned alive on the steps of the town hall with the mayor and sheriff standing by looking on in fair approval. Miller himself was compelled to drop out of high school in order to help support his struggling family. Again, this is the depths of depression. When he could not find work in September of 1939 at the age of 17, he joined the United States Navy. But the Navy that he joined was characterized by an unbridgeable chasm of racial, racial segregation. With the outbreak of the Civil War, former slave Frederick Douglass urged every man who could, could to enlist and get an eagle on his button, a musket on his shoulder, and a star-spangled banner over his head. Military service, he believed, would bring not only freedom for enslaved African Americans, but equal rights under the law to those who had defended the Union. Fifty-seven years later, with the outbreak of World War I, the noted historian and activist W.B. Du Bois noted that nothing else made Negro citizenship conceivable but the record of the Negro as a fighter. The tradition of black sailors in the United States Navy was, by 1942, a long and honorable one. Blacks served in the Navy during every one of its wars and were particularly vital during, to the Union Navy during the American Civil War. 
during the American Revolution, highly skilled black mariners served in the Continental Navy, as well as aboard state-sponsored navies, privateers, and merchant ships. With American independence in 1783, however, and the demise of the Continental Navy, most black sailors were returned to slavery. When the United States reconstituted its Navy in 1794 to defend American merchant vessels against attacks by the Barbary pirates, free blacks were allowed to enlist with the permission of the ship's commanding officer. The Navy, however, severely restricted the numbers of Africans, African Americans who might serve, with the Acting Secretary of the Navy, Isaac Chauncey, prescribing a limit of 5% on the number of black recruits that the service might enlist. This quota system continued for the remainder of the anti double period, 5% cap. During the War of 1812, which of course was largely a naval war, African Americans again volunteered their services. Blacks constituted approximately one-sixth of the total personnel and were found aboard American vessels in all ratings. Captain Isaac Chauncey wrote to Oliver Hazard Perry that I have yet to learn that the color of the skin or the cut and trimmings of the coat can affect a man's qualification or usefulness. I have nearly 50 blacks aboard the ship and many are among the first best men I have. By the eve of the Civil War, black sailors comprised approximately two and one half percent of the naval enlisted force. The wartime requirements for additional manpower, however, forced the Navy to abolish its 5% quota and actively recruited free black men. By September 1861, the Navy Department authorized the enlistment of black sailors when their services can be made useful under the same forms and regulations applied to other enlistments. And on the 17th of July, 1862, Congress authorized President Lincoln to employ persons of African descent as he saw fit to help preserve the Union. But in the decades following the Civil War, discrimination and the rise of Jim Crow laws increased. Black sailors lost their status, status that they had earned with wartime service, and their participation in the fleet dropped from a high of 20% in 1865 to 9.5% in the 1890s. During the Spanish-American War, the Navy enlisted blacks into the ranks on a fully integrated basis. It did, however, limit African-Americans to the enlisted ranks, no black officers. Then, Following the Supreme Court's 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which legalized segregation, the number of black sailors declined even further, such that by the beginning of World War I, blacks compromised less than 3% of the enlisted men. Further, segregation was rapidly becoming part of naval policy, a reflection of the national social patterns. During the administration of Woodrow Wilson, to torch him, you'll recall, the Navy reduced the number of black enlistments, and Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels of North Carolina continued the practice of barring black recruits from serving in combat ratings. And of the 10,000 African Americans in the Navy, all but a few were assigned to the Messman branch, which meant that they worked in the laundries and the galleys and served in the officer's mess, maintained officer's billets, and that was the extent of their opportunity. So by the time Doris Miller joined the Navy, black men who wore the blue were not only ineligible for promotion, they were all consigned to the lowly investment branch. They were tasked with making the beds and shining the shoes of their officers and waiting on them in the officer's mess. As one of Miller's fellow messmen said, they were merely seagoing bellhops, chambermaids, and dishwashers. By regulation, they could not be trained in or assigned to any other rating. 
such as signals, engineering, or gunnery. They were not even allowed to wear the familiar bell and anchor buttons of the United States Navy on their uniforms, but wore just plain brass buttons. But Miller was going to say that it beats sitting around Waco working as a busboy, going nowhere, <clears throat> and after attending a racially segregated boot camp in Norfolk, Virginia, he was assigned to the battleship, West Virginia. The Weavey, due to rising tensions between the United States and the growing Japanese Empire, was transferred to the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. There, on the morning of December 7, 1942, the date that will live in infamy, the fleet came under attack from carrier launched aircraft of the Japanese Imperial Navy. As we all know, that attack was a devastating surprise. When the raid struck, 24-year-old mess attendant second-class Doris Miller was below decks doing the laundry of one of the ship's ensigns. But with the first torpedo's explosion, he reported to his duty station, the ship's magazine, where his assignment was to pass ammunition up to the gunners. He found the magazine already flooded, however, and so went seeking reassignment. He encountered Lieutenant Commander D.C. Johnson, who ordered him to the signals deck where West Virginia's captain, Mervyn Sharp Benyon, lay mortally wounded. He was eviscerated by a piece of shrapnel blown off of Arizona, which was birthed next to him in Battleship Road. Miller, uh, mentioned that he had been a high school fullback, heavyweight boxing champion, big man, um, was ordered to lift his dying captain and carry him to a place of relative safety, a sheltered spot just aft of the conning tower under the port side at the aircraft guns. By this time, the ship had sustained heavy damage from six Japanese torpedoes and two bombs and had taken on a drastic list silencing the ship's port side and the aircraft guns, listening to port and the guns were awash. Her starboard guns, however, were still operational, so Lieutenant J.G. Frederick H. White ordered Miller to feed one of the pair of 50 caliber Browning machine guns that stood idly nearby, while White, a white officer of course, fired the gun and had clumped incoming Japanese planes. The deck, tilted at a crazy angle, was awash with oil and water. Fires raged. But finding a second machine gun unattended, and without orders, and with absolutely no training in its operation, Miller took control and opened fire. It wasn't hard, he later recounted. I just pulled the trigger, and it worked fine. <laughs> Lieutenant White later reported that, having no training in the weapon, the Messman shooting was largely ineffective. He didn't know very much about the machine gun, but I told him what to do, and he went ahead and did it. He had a good eye. According to Lieutenant Commander Johnson, who was also present, Miller handled his gun well, blazing away as though he had fired one all his life. Miller himself stated that when the Japanese bombers attacked my ship at Pearl Harbor, I forgot all about the fact that I and the other Negroes can be only messmen in the Navy and are not taught how to mount an anti-aircraft gun. Only when his gun ran out of ammunition and the critically damaged West Virginia began to sink did he cease firing and only when Captain Binion was officially pronounced dead did the little group of officers and men abandon the ship's burning bridge. Descending to the boat deck, Miller helped to pull sailors from the burning water, unquestionably saving the lives of a number of men. But by then, the ship was flooded below decks and rapidly 
settling in the shallows in the harbors of shallow water. And her senior surviving officer gave the order to abandon the ship. Doris Miller was one of the last three men to leave West Virginia. He and his shipmates swam three or four hundred yards to shore, avoiding patches of flaming oil from, from Arizona. When he splashed ashore, Miller later told his brother, with those bullets splattering all around me, it was by the grace of God that I never got a scratch. Even then, Miller helped rescue scores of injured sailors, bringing them to safety ashore. Of West Virginia's 1,541 crew members, 130 were killed and 52 wounded. Seven of the eight American battleships were sunk or badly damaged. Norris Miller attributed his survival to Providence. It must have been God's strength and Mother's blessing, he told the newspaper reporter. A considerable controversy still exists as to how effective Miller's gunnery actually was. Estimates, guess it's really, ran as high as half a dozen planes, and his justifiably proud niece made the claim that his gunnery <coughs> saved the west coast of the United States from invasion. That was <laughs> yeah. But despite Miller's best effort, only 29 of 353 attacking Japanese aircraft failed to return to their carriers, and only one of those fell within range of West Virginia's guns. Even it was most likely splashed by fire from her sister ship, Maryland, which was parked alongside. As Victor Delano, who is an ensign on West Virginia's bridge, beside Miller, related in 1993, everyone else in the bay was shooting at it as well. Miller felt very pleased with the destruction of that plane, and I don't blame him. But there was a lot of other guys shooting at it as well. White reported that he saw Miller shooting, but I wouldn't turn. But I would term it rather wild. He said. So I doubt that he hit anything. I certainly did not see him shoot down the plane. Many of you probably know Walter Lord's book, uh, Day of Infamy, the history of Pearl Harbor. He said that, that Dory Miller was the greater hazard to the Navy than he was to the Japanese. <laughs> but uh, however many planes he may or may not have shot down is really beside the point. Doris Miller's heroic actions at Pearl Harbor helped to launch a revolution. A revolution in the way that black men and women are regarded in the day's armed forces, and he deserves the niche in the pantheon of American heroes for he provides an immeasurably important symbol for black Americans in their struggle for desegregation and equal opportunity, not only in the armed forces, but throughout the breadth of American society. Within weeks of the disaster at Pearl Harbor, the Navy's public relations officials released a number of stories of heroism equal to any in the United States naval history. After action reports of the, the attack reference the activities of an unknown black sailor, and soon hearsay stories began to circulate. On 22 December 1941, the New York Times printed a sketchy description related by an unidentified naval officer of a black sailor who stood on the hot decks of his battleship and directed the fighting. This mess attendant who never before had fired a gun, the story went, man the machine gun on the bridge until his ammunition was exhausted. This unknown best man was added, but not by name, to the Navy's 1941 honor roll of race relations. On New Year's Day, 1942, the Navy released its list of commendations for heroism at Pearl Harbor. On the list was a single commendation for the unnamed black sailor. But when she heard the news of the sailor who had the machine gun, Miller's mother said, 
That's got to be Norris they talking about. The Navy, however, was a full year in determining and disclosing the identity of the heroic vessel. Not until March 1942 did the Pittsburgh Courier, an influential black newspaper, uh, release a story that identified the black vestment as Dory Miller. Bills were quickly introduced in the House and the Senate to award Miller the Medal of Honor. But Georgia Democrat Earl Benson, who is the uh, House of Representatives Chairman of Naval Affairs, stated that Miller's deeds were not deserving of the nation's highest award for valor. And he was seconded not only by the Secretary of the Navy, uh, William Franklin Knox, but by the Congressional delegation of Miller's home state. Numerous historians and political leaders have argued at that time and since that gallant as the sacrifices of 15 men, all of whom were white and most of whom were officers, many of whom were senior officers, who were awarded the Medal of Honor that day, Dory Miller's exploits were at least of equal distinction, and all the more so because of the oppressive racial stigma under which he performed so heroically. <clears throat> but while this controversy was raging in the press and in Washington, Miller had been reassigned to the heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis and was on duty in the South Pacific. Mother, don't worry about me and tell all my friends not to shed any tears for me. For when the dark clouds pass over, I'll be back on the sunny side. But his rating remained that of Bessman, and his battle station remained in the hole handling ammunition. But in the States, politicians, journalists, uh, and journalists charged the Navy with foot training and indifference to blacks in the armed forces with Walter White, chairman of the NAACP, pointing out that no citations had been awarded to black personnel for acts of gallantry or heroism during the attack, and urging President Roosevelt and the Secretary of the Navy that official recognition be given to Miller. <clears throat> Without in any manner detracting from the heroism and gallantry under fire of white Americans who died in Pearl Harbor, uh, White submitted, the heroism of this Negro mess attendant merits, merits special consideration. <clears throat> Finally forced by growing public opinion to recognize Miller's actions, President Franklin D. Roosevelt authorized the bestowal of the Naval Cross, the Navy Cross, I'm sorry, for Miller, the first such medal ever awarded to a black sailor. On 27 May 1942, Miller was presented the Navy Cross by Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, aboard on the flight deck of his, his flagship, the aircraft carrier, Nim Enterprise. Nimitz, also a native Texan, stated that Miller's award marks the first time in this conflict that such high tribute has been made in the Pacific Fleet to a member of his race, and I'm sure <laughs> that the future will see others similarly honored for their acts. In June, the courier called for him to be returned to the United States for a war bond tour, just as several white heroes had been. The paper demanded that the Secretary order him, order him home so that he may perform the same service among his people that white heroes are performing for their people. Wendell Wilkie, uh, the 1940 Republican nominee for the presidency, and uh, Fiorello de LaGuardia, the very popular mayor of New York, seconded this uh, <coughs> urge, and uh, Secretary, Knox, or Secretary Knox to allow Miller to return to the United States on a war bond tour, and Miller himself was eager to return home. As he wrote to the courier on 26th, September, I do hope your paper will continue the campaign on my behalf. It would be a great pleasure to get back, if only for a few days. Well, that campaign bore fruit when he was ordered home. 
After a year at sea, Miller arrived at Pearl Harbor on 23 November 1942. Over the course of the next two months, Miller gave talks in Oakland, California, in its hometown of Waco, in Dallas, and in Chicago, promoting war bond sales and accepting tokens of admiration from black communities. But perhaps more significantly, most significantly, on 16 January 1943, Miller addressed the first class of black sailors to graduate from Camp Roberts Falls the segregated all-black section of the U.S. Naval Training Station at Great Lakes, Illinois. <coughs> the greatest honor that the Navy could pay Miller, the editor of the Pittsburgh Courier wrote, would be for it to abolish forthwith the restrictions now in force so that black Americans can serve their country and their Navy in any capacity. This action by the Navy would not only reward a hero, but would serve dramatic notice that this country is in fact a democracy in an all-out war against anti-democratic forces. Due largely to Miller's inspiration, in April 1942, Secretary Knox announced that Negro recruits who volunteer for general service would be trained at Camp Smalls as gunner's mates, quartermasters, radioman, yeoman, bosun's mates, radar operations, and other ratings besides messmen. In January 1944, the Navy also opened a modest officer training program at Camp Smalls for black sailors. commissioning its first 12 black officers on 17 March, 1944. Now, wrote one newspaper, the heroic tradition of Dory Miller at Pearl Harbor will serve as an everlasting inspiration to every young man to more fully serve his country and his Navy. This young man, by the way, was Franklin Roosevelt's valet, yeah. Roosevelt's personal servant, and yeah. Roosevelt had him Camp Smalls. The keynote of Miller's talk at Camp Smalls was the tremendous pride he felt in the Navy and of the privilege of being a part of it. It is almost unbelievable just what the perfect coordination and strength of our Navy actually is, he told the reporter and he urged the new sailors to take advantage of their opportunities. Well, after departing from Camp Smalls, Miller headed south, first to Montgomery, Alabama, and then home to Waco for Christmas leave. Dory talked a little about his war experiences, his father told a reporter, because he said it made him think of his dead buddies. But while the revolution that he had helped inspire was happening around him, Miller himself was transferred for reassignment. On 1 June 1943, he arrived aboard the newly constructed air escort carrier USS Liscombe Bay as an officer's cook, third class. His new ship was a CVE, the so-called baby flat top only half the length of such fleet carriers as his enterprise, escort carriers were relatively slow, less well-armed, less ar well-armored, but less expensive to build and quickly built. Liscombe Bay supported the marine landings on Tarawa, pounding Japanese gun emplacements and air bases. With Thanksgiving approaching, Miller wrote to his mother that he did not expect the war to end soon, but asked that she prepare a place at the table for me in 1945. I will eat dinner with you all with a smile. Tell my friends to live the life that I am living. But on 24 November 1943, the day before Thanksgiving, the ship's lookout shouted, shouted, Christ, here comes the torpedo! A single torpedo from a Japanese submarine 
struck the carrier on the starboard side. <coughs> Miller reported to General Quarters that a few moments later, the ship's aircraft bomb magazine exploded. We were hit just back of midships and just out of the engine compartment to a fire who called Fireman Third Class Robert E. Haynes, one of the survivors. From here on back, everything was instantly gone. The thinly armored list conveyed carried over 200,000 pounds of bombs, 120,000 gallons of bunker oil, many thousands of gallons of aviation fluid, fuel, and innumerable quantities of 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter cabin shells, all of which exploded in mass. Most of the crew died instantly. This convey sank within 23 minutes. The CBE was indeed, as the sailors sardonically claimed, combustible, vulnerable, and expendable. The casualty list was among the largest of any naval leaders vessel in the war. Only 227 officers and men survived from a crew of over 900. Doris Miller was not among them. He was listed as presumed dead and after 365 days was reported as killed in action. His body was never recovered. Doris Miller's death, however, was not in vain. The memory of his life is burned brightly as an example of how an underprivileged and oppressed young man from rural Texas can rise above poverty and racial discrimination not only to display great courage, devotion, and patriotism, but to help, help alter the course of American history. Ronald Reagan may have been inaccurate when in the 1975 speech he regaled his audience with the story of a Negro sailor whose total duties involved kitchen type duties who shot down four dive bombers with a borrowed machine gun. But he understood Miller's true importance. When the first bombs dropped, were dropped on Pearl Harbor, Reagan and Tom, that was the, that was when segregation and the military forces came to an end. That of course was not literally true, but Miller's heroism at Pearl Harbor and the legend that it engendered were directly responsible for helping to roll back the Navy's policy of racial segregation and prejudice and in the chain of events serve as a powerful catalyst for the civil rights movement of the 1960s that brought an end to the worst of America's racial intolerance. The Dorian Millers of the future predicted Texas Representative Barbara Jordan on June 30, 1973 at the christening of a Knox-class frigate, the USS Miller, named in his honor. The Dorian Millers of the future will be captains as well as cooks. And indeed, by 2016, the United States Navy had six black admirals, one of whom had achieved four-star rank and was serving as commander of the Atlantic Fleet. As the Pittsburgh Courier proclaimed in 1956, Doris Miller had died for his country so that his people might rise another notch in dignity and courage. Every blow struck for civil rights is a monument to Dory Miller. Thank you. Sad kind of epilogue, by the way. This was USS Miller. She served for about six years, was served, sold to the Turkish Navy, which used her for scrap and then used the hull for target practice. Oh, no, wow. horrible argument there, I think. But, yeah. I'd be happy to try to entertain questions if you like. Yes, sir. What was his final rank? He, he, it sounded like he was a uh, missed in second class, and then when he was reassigned to Lisbon Bay, he got taken to third class. Uh, he he was first a, class? His final
final ranking was cooks, uh, officers cook, second class, okay. which was a brand new rating. Uh, there had never been such a thing before, but the, the Navy was kind of re-shuffling to. So that make it it was considered a promotion. He got a little, a little bump in pay, uh, got to wear a, one more stripe on his, his uniform. But uh, he, he still, you know, funny thing, for all of his apparent gunnery expertise, or at least seal, he was not particularly interested in leaving the Messman's branch. Because when he left the Navy, he wanted to uh, buy an eye club. And he thought that his experience in the Messman's branch would be good training for that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, every time you see film clips of Pearl Harbor, you always see an iconic shot of a black man shooting a water cooled drowning. Right. Was that John Ford's reenactment, or was that an actual footage, or that's supposed to be cool? No, it, it's it's uh, it's Hollywood. Okay. There, there is no there is no you footage know what whatsoever about. from from the deck of. You know the film clip I'm talking oh, about? Oh, I do, yeah. I, I think I put up a, a still from uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, where the, the role of Dory Miller was played by Cuba Gooding Jr. But he shows up in, in Tora, Tora, Tora as well. Uh, actually, there were several movies. Uh, one submarine movie that moved Dory Miller to submarine service, which makes no sense. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it, it's all Hollywood. There's no film footage at all from the decks of West Virginia and Pearl Harbor. Um, yes, how does the Navy, so how does the, the African-American service in the Navy compare with their enforcement with the, the Army? Was it the same? It, it, it trailed. Uh, the Navy was, was much more reactionary perhaps, <coughs> than, than the other services. Uh, of course, it's not until Harry Truman's administration that, that the armed services were fully integrated, units were integrated. Uh, many black men in the Army during World War II were still consigned to labor battalions, uh, and truck drivers, and so forth, under white officers, but the Navy was particularly slow. And of course, the, the Air Force, there was no Air Force per se, but uh, <coughs> black airmen were not allowed to fly. Uh, the, the idea of being, and, and we see this in, in print, I mean, in official government documents, that they just don't have the intellectual capacity. I mean, that.
That's all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, of all of these, that was his mother, by the way. Uh, there is a U.S. postage stamp uh, issued in his honor. Any number of buildings, streets, housing projects, uh, uh, barracks in, in Pearl Harbor. Well, lots and lots of things named after Dory Miller. My favorite. Yeah. G.I. Joe Dahl. Uh oh. <laughs> Battleship Road Defender. When you know you made it is when you get it. Yes. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Yeah. My very great pleasure. Okay. And okay. Shameless Commerce here. Uh, I did quite a book about Dory. Uh, a and Press published it. Interested, it's, it's out there.